Okay. Welcome to the third episode of I'm in the Band, a podcast hosted by me, Allison Wolf. Each episode, I'll be talking with a different punk musician or artist, door kicking, ceiling smashing people who've made their art their way. When I was starting my own all girl band in the early 90s, it wasn't easy to find feminist role models in the punk scene. I was lucky to come across the documentary film Decline of Western Civilization, a cult classic which exposed kids like me to the first wave of LA punk. What stayed with me all these years is the image of lead singer Alice Bagg. In the late 70s, she was a front woman of LA punk band, The Bags. She was an amazing performer, writhing around on stage, glaring into the audience, and screaming into her mic. Punk music was an outlet for Alice. She grew up in East LA and had a pretty troubled childhood which she would later document in her 2011 memoir, Violence Girl. Alice continues to be an active voice in punk, Latinx, and feminist communities. Hello, um, today we have a guest, a special guest. I've gotten to know Alice, and she still inspires me. I'm glad you added the special part. (laughs) And um, could you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Alice Bagg. I am a queer Chicana musician, writer, feminist, pretzel eater. (laughs) Peanut butter pretzel eater. Peanut butter pretzel eater. (laughs) Cool. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Could I ask you a little bit about uh, what it was like going to school in East LA or in LA in the um, LA Unified School District? Well, when I started school, I was, um, I didn't speak the language. So that that formed a wedge between me and some of my teachers. But I also was, I think because of what was happening at home, I felt somewhat disconnected from my peers as well. So I didn't have a lot of friends. And in middle school, uh, somebody introduced me to uh, the music of David Bowie. And David Bowie to me seemed like an outsider. He was not only presenting this ambiguous sexuality, but he was also like, I think, barely human. You know, you'd look at him and you'd think like, where did this creature come from? And he was intriguing to me because if I felt like an outsider, David Bowie was this almost like extraterrestrial creature that was successfully performing this wonderful music that I loved. So I identified with him outsider to outsider. During those same junior high school years, I became a big fan of glam music and I started reading a lot of rock magazines. During those glam years, I really aspired to be a groupie because I felt like groupies were the closest that a girl could get to being involved in the music. Uh, And I blame rock magazines for that because they would give so little attention to the women that were rocking that, like I remember Susie Quattro, but Susie Quattro, if she was in a magazine, she'd get like, you know, one eighth of a page or something. So I really felt like even though there were women creating music, they were not given their fair share of attention. They were not treated as equals. Just like, here's a sprinkle of this weird thing that's happening. You know, women in rock. Right, like a, a trend. curiosity. Yeah. It wasn't something to be taken seriously. And the, the normal thing <laughs> was for women to be like, you know, out throwing themselves at the rock stars. And so as a teen, I bought into that. I really thought that that was my way to get into rock and roll. How did you start your first band and... I guess that went right along with the beginning of punk in L.A. It was high school. I was going to Hollywood, which is where most of the glam shows were happening. I was a total, total Elton John 
stalker. But I had other friends who were also stalkers and were living in other parts of the city and um, going to other schools. So we'd meet at our stalking sites in hopes of like catching a glimpse of someone. So I had my stalking pals, which were um, my friend Patricia, who would later be in a band with me, and my friend Margo, who uh, also would be in a band with me later. And we decided that we were going to um, just start learning how to play instruments. That's how I formed my first band, was just by hanging out with these other girls who were also huge fans. And we all wanted to play guitar, I don't know why. But at a certain point, we decided different people were going to play different things. And I was assigned uh, vocals. And was your first band The Bags? My first band was um, a band called Femme Fatale. We were named after this cheap brand of makeup called La Femme. And then one day, I was at a, at a club, the Starwood, and um, my friends said, hey, R Rodney Bigenheimer's over there. Why don't you go up to him and tell him about our band? even though we didn't really have a complete band. I told him about our band, and he said he would help if, I, if he had a chance. So um, I woke up one morning, maybe a week or two later, and my mother came to my door, and she's like, there's a man on the phone who wants to talk to you. And um, she was suspicious, but she handed me the phone, and he's like, my name is Kim Fowley. And, and he had this really like rough and... I don't know, a uh, bossy voice. Mm. Do you know who I am? And I said, like, yes, I know who you are, Kim. <laughs> and uh, he started telling me about how he had created the Runaways and how he could do it all over again. And he was going to form a band. And he'd heard from Rodney that I was interested in, uh, in being in an all-girl band. And I said, yeah, well, I have an all-girl band. And he's like, well, I want you and your, and your bandmates to come down and audition for me. And just talking to him, I was a little suspicious about whether I wanted to be involved with him. But I talked to my friends, and they were really excited. They're like, yeah, let's go. So we got there, and there were, like, all these female musicians that I didn't even know existed from all over L.A. And um, it was this scenario where he had everyone in, in a room, and he would call people in different combinations. He would call one drummer up, and then he'd say, you come over here and play bass, and you play guitar. And then if he didn't like the combination, he'd throw whoever he didn't like outside and say, wait outside. And then he'd keep whoever he thought was doing well. And I very quickly went outside. And um, I think Patricia lasted two or three rounds before she went outside. But um, as we were waiting outside, all the rejects started networking we started talking to each other and saying what kind of music do you like what do you want to play and we actually found our drummer that way you know Bramobile actually got a postcard from Kim Fowley when we started oh really yeah and it was like typed up on a postcard really small and it just said I am Kim Fowley producer of Runaways I want to make your band something something you know and it was like but I mean, of course, we never responded. But good for you. <laughs> but, like, yeah. yeah, we already were just like, screw that guy. But like, it was still pretty amazing to get a postcard from him. And I hope I can find it somewhere. Were the Runaways uh, an influence at all, or were they really together yet? Or? I think the Runaways were uh, an influence a little bit later when uh, when we first decided that we wanted to play. I don't think the Runaways were were playing yet, but once we heard the Runaways. It, definitely changed our trajectory because up until that point we had wanted to form a glam band and our influence our musical influences were Queen and Elton John and David Bowie and if you think about that music it is very sophisticated and heavily orchestrated and we were at the point where we were barely getting through smoke on the water like we had to look at our fingers to make chord changes and I remember we were already practicing as a band when we first heard The Runaways and when we first heard The Ramones. And both those bands, uh, their, their music seemed to us that they were closer to our ability. How did punk 
encourage you or influence your playing? Um, my boyfriend, Jeffrey, joined a band called The Weirdos. And I remember he wanted me to come see them. And Patricia, who was my bass player, she and I decided to go early, go to sound check. And as we were waiting outside, we saw this group of young kids crushing food and throwing it at each other and spraying spray cheese onto each other's tongues. And I'm not sure if they called us over or we just went over and said hello to them, but we introduced ourselves and they said they were in a band called The Germs and that this was their first gig and they were gonna be opening. And then they started laughing and said, we don't know how to play. And Patricia and I didn't believe them because we thought, well, they must they must be like rough like us, just starting to play, you know. But then when we saw them on stage, they were a, a hot mess. <laughs> they really did not know how to play. But they were so entertaining. People were laughing, screaming at them, telling them to shut up. So I think seeing um, that show, like Patricia and I were just like, we don't need to play like Queen. We can just get on stage now. Talk about the early days of the LA punk rock scene um, a little more and just talk about the environment and like also how did Femme Fatale break up and then how did you start the bags? The bags um, started as an idea that Patricia had. She lived in Whittier and she had gone out on a boring weekday with a group of friends and they decided to put paper grocery bags on their heads, cut out the eyes, nose and mouth and then ride around the city pulling over to talk to pedestrians. <laughs> so um, she said it turned a boring evening into like this really fun night. So she wanted us to play with bags on our heads and I thought that was a great idea. So that's how we decided to form the bags. And um, Femme Fatale was already breaking up when Patricia decided that we should do the bags. We had a friend that Patricia knew from school named Janet Kuntz who played lead guitar. So she joined she joined us and um, we put an ad in the paper. I think we, oh, we, I don't remember the exact references that we gave, but I, they were weird enough to attract some weird people. <laughs> and the weird people that, that we attracted were inevitably men. I think we had put that we wanted women, but this guy named Geza X called us and he said, I know I'm not a girl, but you've got to give me a chance. And I know a drummer who's great and I can play guitar too. And so we met them and they were really into wearing the bags on their heads and they liked all the same things we liked. So we started playing as the bags with Jonah Nini on drums, Geza X on guitar, Janet Kuntz was our other guitarist, Patricia Morrison was our bass player and I was the vocalist. What was it like playing your first show? Um, the first show, even though I started out really excited about decorating my bag and making an outfit, I made. I decided I was going to make a dress out of tiny little safety pins. But before I went on stage, I had a conversation with my friend Bobby Pin, later to be renamed Darby Crash, who was convinced that I should not wear a bag on my head. And the reason is he felt that the audience had to connect with me and they had to see my face. And he was just like, he was drunk. And so was I. So he, <laughs> so he was just like, no, no, you can't do it. And so I went on stage and he was in the audience. And every time that he got a chance, he would try to tug at my bag. And once he ripped a little piece off, the bag didn't sit right on my head. It was like, you know, lopsided. So I was like, I ended up like singing peeking out of a rip in a paper bag and after like two or three songs I started sweating and the paper bag became like this paper mache that was stuck to my skin uh, aside from the fact that I was singing and feeling crazy and feeling like all this rage surfacing 
I also remember the feeling of, I have a voice. People are listening to me. I'm going to scream. I'm going to like shout out to the universe. And it was a very powerful and exciting feeling. Gotta sit to the seat. You want to put a on breathe. But we lost control. We're going to do as we please. You can be a prophet. What was it like playing on stage being a woman in punk back then? And was it a place that you felt like you could be safe in and create in? Yeah, my experience in the very early punk scene was that it was very inclusive. You know, going to see the germs playing with Donna Rhea and Lorna Doom was like immediately, it immediately made it like a place where I felt welcome. Seeing those two women get up and make noise you know they weren't they weren't great musicians at that point they were just like gutsy women who wanted to be on stage and I just felt like yeah I can do that I said that that uh, Bobby Pin would grab at my clothes and grab at my bag but then I would pay him back I would go to one of his shows and I would grab at his shirt and tear his clothes and and we thought that it meant that we liked each other that it was like that's what that's what wild fans do. They try to rip at your clothes. They try and like get a little piece of you because you're so great. Well, it speaks a lot to the blurring of the lines between audience and performer yeah. in punk. You know. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there could have been a punk scene if people that were on stage didn't stick around and watch the other bands, you know, because it was tiny. It, it just felt like you could do anything. Well, it seemed like at the time the epicenter of the punk scene was in Hollywood, right? Which is, some people I think would be surprised to know because it's so different now. Hollywood is always sort of the, the epicenter uh, of both glam and the early, very early punk scene. People came from all backgrounds. I have friends who were from South Central. I had friends, who, like one of the people in my band was from Brentwood. So you have like people from different economic classes too and different ethnicities and the thing I think that we all had in common was that we were the misfits in our own neighborhoods. So we made the journey home to Hollywood, which was a place where we felt welcome, where we felt like we had people who understood us, who treated us like family. So a lot of us ended up moving into this one apartment building that was just um, it was very close to the mask. And it was called the Canterbury Apartments. And uh, it was a place that had cheap rent. So there was a whole bunch of us that lived there. And it was almost like, you know, a dorm atmosphere where you could go, if you were bored, you'd go to somebody else's apartment and do something or make flyers for a show or start a band, you know. And then if you crossed Hollywood Boulevard was uh, The Mask, which was kind of like our clubhouse where we had shows, there were rehearsal spaces, and um, there was also always the opportunity to, to hang out and do something creative. Yeah, could you talk about some of the creative energy and creative projects that emerged from the punk rock dorm scene? Well, one of the things that we did was that we talked the landlord into allowing us to convert the unused basement into rehearsal studios. We had so many musicians that people would just like, you know, write songs together, play in groups that only played one time. You know, you get together in the basement of the Canterbury, you rehearse one day, and then that night you play a show. We lived and breathed punk. We weren't like weekend punks. We were like, a lot of us rehearsed every day or several times a week diligently. It was an environment that just promoted creativity. You could be a bass player in this band, a singer in that one, or a drummer if you wanted to, or if you wanted, to, even better, you know, if you wanted to play a pot or a pan or a, or a kazoo or some unorthodox instrument, that would be even better. And how long did that scene and community thrive um, before it started changing and punk started changing into hardcore? I really think that the that scene in its purest form only lasted about two years um, and then it started falling apart the mask closed it was uh, it 
was continuously targeted by um, the police and the fire department. So it was always a struggle to keep it open. Um, and the scene at the Canterbury turned, a lot of us started doing drugs. I mean, there, there was just so much freedom that we, I think we blew ourselves up. Some of the people started dying, some became addicted to drugs. And I, for one, decided that I wanted to stay alive, so I just decided to move away. Boo-hoo, he started to cry. Bam, came the punch to the eye. You provoke him, he says. Don't you know how he gets? But when your head hits... How did you get into writing? And what... I don't know, what made you think that you could write a book? Well, I didn't think that I could write a book. I actually thought that I couldn't write a book. (laughs) I, um, I was talking to a friend at a bar, and I started telling her stories, and she was laughing and saying what a good storyteller I was. And, of course, we were drunk, so it all made sense. And um, she said, you should write a book. And I went home, and I told my husband, And he said, I've been telling you that you really should write a book. And I said, but I'm not a writer, never studied writing. I don't think I could do it. And he reminded me that I blog every day. So the next morning when I woke up, he had left the laptop um, open on the kitchen table. And it said, the true life adventures of violence girl. So I blogged a page and I posted it. And then before the week was out, I had some followers. So... Every book starts with one page, right? So I blogged the whole book. And a big part of the reason that I was able to finish it was because I had followers that would say, hey, I'm waiting for the next installment. Like, So I could not take a day off because I would get complaints from, from my followers. And as I continued to write, I became a better writer, I think. And I felt more confident and I started to imagine that it was going to be a book. Were there any parts of writing the book or the blog and recalling your history that were painful or cathartic? How did you feel during the process? For me, when I started writing Violence Girl and I allowed myself to see what was there, I realized that it was right on the surface. I didn't have to like look very far for the memories to come back. It was something that was um, physically draining. I remember writing and then feeling nauseous. I had to deal with stuff that I hadn't dealt with as a child, you know, and realize, oh, this is where these feelings come from. This is where my actions come from. And I just felt like I got to know myself better. Could you tell us about growing up and just some stuff about your childhood and your family and stuff like that? Yeah, I grew up in East LA in an area called Belvedere. um, And I was um, a first generation American. My parents spoke only Spanish to me at home. And I grew up watching like, you know, Spanish TV shows and reading Spanish language comic books and this novelas de amor. So I I felt like I was a Mexican living in America. (laughs) And um, I also grew up um, in an abusive household. My father was uh, very abusive towards my mother. He beat her and like dragged her around and kicked her. And I feel like I have a lot of anger and a lot of trauma and a lot of rage that didn't come out until I was much older. Can you talk about some of the experience of being a child experiencing domestic violence? Yeah, I think being a child experiencing domestic violence, even though it's not directed at you, when somebody is hitting someone that you love and care about, it's like they're hitting you. Emotionally, they're hitting you. So I would have these after effects at school where I'd feel sick, I'd get stomach aches, I'd, you know, just... Not, I'd want to just go home and go to sleep. I was, I think, experiencing signs of depression and trauma. There's 
parts of my experience that I don't remember. You know, there's one scene that I write about in my book, Violence Girl, where my father is asking me to spit on my mother. My mother is kneeling in front of him and he's telling me, spit on her or I'm going to kill her. And at that point, I just, I don't remember what, I remember like feeling like I don't know what to do, how, you know, I want to save my mother and I don't know what I did. And I think that's just my my psyche protecting me. And also I think about abuse and sort of how kids kind of grow up with that and how it affects them later in life and sort of this idea of who's identifying with the abuser and who identifies with the victim. I'm glad you brought that up because I identified with both my mother and my father. I felt terrible for my mother, but I also had the feeling that things were very black and white, that there was definitely one person on top making all the decisions and ruling with an iron fist. And there was one person that was underneath being subjugated. And I just felt like I never want to be the person that's underneath. So in many ways, I identified with my father and I felt like you either had to be the one on top or the one on the bottom. And for years, really, I didn't realize that neither of those positions is a position of strength. A position of strength is being able to work and connect with other people, and there's strength in that. The other stuff is just an attempt to control things that you can't control, can't control other people. I'm kind of interested, too, in how the violence that you grew up with came out on stage. I was not planning to express it. When I first got in a band, I thought, I'm going to sing pretty. <laughs> and then I started performing live and I realized that I had anger issues. I had rage in me that was coming out on stage and um, I sort of went out of control on stage and I wasn't singing pretty. I was transforming into this monster that people were afraid of, but I'm so grateful that I had punk as a sort of therapy uh, where I felt like I could do whatever I wanted and it, it helped that I was wearing a bag on my head and that gave me a feeling of anonymity. I, I could be totally open without being exposed. And it was a feeling of being out of control, but also having power of having a voice. So um, I think when you've felt like you didn't have a voice for so long, being on stage and having a microphone and having people watching you, even if you were like, you know, going crazy, it felt like you had a voice. I'm really happy that you're still creating and that you've, you have maintained creative outlets throughout your whole career and your whole life. Could you talk about kind of like why it might be important to do so? I define myself as an artist. So if I don't have some type of creative expression, I, my life is not worth living. <laughs> I feel like I always have to be doing something, um, whether it's playing music or writing or painting. That's what makes me happy. <laughs> and... How are you challenging the system with your creative output? Like, I guess I see you and a lot of people I know as cultural activists. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that it's a cultural thing because I think people, you know, they when they think of an activist, they think of one type of activist, and that is like, you know, somebody out marching or collecting signatures or something. And I don't think that we have to only be one type of activist. It's within your community, it's within your grasp, and even within your family that you can make real change. So I think one of the ways that I try to do it is not only by having conversations with people, but by writing songs that bring attention to, to subjects that I feel need more attention, or by giving voice to, for example, like creating a website where women can talk about their experiences in the early LA punk scene when their experiences had been largely ignored by 
people who were writing books who didn't care that like, you know, that women were represented in equal numbers. They wanted to know, you know, about one or two of the popular bands and everything else that went into creating that scene was just erased. I'm sick of being erased. I'm sick of being erased as a woman. I'm sick of being erased as a person of color and as a queer person. I want my presence felt so that some other young Chicana, some other young queer, some other woman will just feel like I can make a difference and I will be seen and I will be heard. Well, Alice Bag, it is such a pleasure to speak with you. Alice and Wolf, the pleasure is all mine. And thank you so much for also singing on my record. I cannot wait for it to come out. I'm in the Band is brought to you by Title On Air and is produced by me, Allison Wolf, and me, Jonathan Shiflett. You can find our podcast by going to title.com slash US slash on air or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Real Baby Donut. Bye. Let's go.